Hi everyone, welcome to Green Valley Church. My name is Andrew and I am one of our pastors here. I'm excited that you are joining us for our online service. With that, let's join the service now. Good morning, Green Valley. Nice to see you. Nice to be seen. Uh, my name is Rob, one of the members here. So for you regular tenders, welcome. Good morning. For your, uh, If you're here for the first time or second time, we just want to extend you a special welcome. Hope you find this place to be a home, uh, and uh, we extend you a warm greeting. A couple of announcements to draw your attention to, please. We have a fun event coming up. It's an all-church event, so it's for all ages. So if you have an age, you're welcome to come. So um, you can kind of see the details there on the screen. It's next Sunday in the afternoon, and a lot is going on at this. So um, I've been told that children are encouraged to um, dress up in a fun costume. I have been told it's not just for children. So um, adults, you're welcome to do that as well. And so a lot of things are going on. So let's see. Um, you can kind of see there in the O of Merry Halloween, that is the little logo for Mary, um, Operation Christmas, where um, boxes are packed and they are shipped around the world. Um, and kids, it's, it's, for a lot of them, it's their only Christmas gift, but it opens the door to be able to share the gospel with them, and it's a really neat project. So we are going to uh, assemble a bunch of boxes. You can walk home with boxes that you can assemble there and bring them back at a future date. Will there be food? Oh, I'm glad you asked. So there is going to be a pie potluck. So that would mean feel free to bring a pie to put into the potluck. And I was kind of looking around for some recipes, and, and I found some things here interesting. But um, apple pies in, in Jamaica right now um, are only $2.50. Uh, banana cream pies in Antigua are $4.25. And key lime pie in St. Thomas, um, three dollars and eighty-seven cents. Those are the pie rates of the Caribbean. There you go. Thank you. <laughs> so <laughs> you never know what you're going to find on Google. So um, also, um, it wouldn't be a fun event if we didn't have candy. So um, another way that you could participate in this, that you can come, park your car, open your trunk, decorate it, and, and then kids will kind of go through and, and trick-or-treat, or as they would say, trunk-or-treat in the midst of that. So that is a fun way to be involved in this. And I was talking to Dr. Bergman, uh, my optometrist, and, and he's going to pass out candy corneas. <laughs> We're going downhill real fast. All right, um, let's see if there are any other fun, there's a lot of things happening on that. So lots of ways for you to be involved in that fun, fun event. All right, moving on. So we've got a shape seminar and this is going to be a, a great opportunity. If you haven't done this, this is a place where you kind of get to l l discover how God has uniquely created, wired, and gifted you to help you find out um, how you're made and your passions and put those two together to be able to enter into the world and, and serve with a greater purpose. So um, every time I, people see this is like, oh, wow, are we getting in shape? But if in the meantime, if you want to get in shape and you haven't done much lately, I would suggest with lunges, it's always a good first step. <laughs> there we go. All right. So th there is something. Okay. So you can see the date. It was going to be earlier, but now it's the 30th. And I believe... Um, 
there you go. Lots of details on there. That's why they have a neat little brochure. They have all the important details, and I think that would be it. Before I dig myself any deeper, I'm going to pray. Join me in prayer, would you please? Heavenly Father, we are thankful and grateful that we can gather here today. Um, thank you for the gift that it is to have fellowship. Um, thank you for um, the new folks here. Um, Lord, we just uh, speak a blessing of welcome over them. Um, help prepare our hearts and minds uh, for the word um, and the words that you have for us from your word through Doug. And uh, we just speak a blessing over him. We're thankful and grateful for who you are. In his name we pray. Amen. All right, welcome to, uh, and, and that's fun, Rob. Thank you for, uh, for that, I guess. Um, <clears throat> it's so good to have you with us, and especially to our online audience who are now watching. We're recording these live uh, to be uh, following along online, too. We want to welcome you as well. Uh, great to be here together as we continue through this series uh, that is a provocative look at the book of Judges, a part of the Bible that we don't look at that often. I was thinking about back when I was in high school, I uh, was invited by this, these, this family to join them on their family vacation, and they taught me how to water ski. And I didn't know how to water ski. This is the first time. Talk about a humbling experience, learning to water ski. They were all really good at it. I had never done it before, and it would, it, you know, face plant. I'd get up. I would just, I would just wipe out. Uh, and, you know, you, it was just a very humbling experience. You think you're going to get up. You're just like almost, 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 nope, back into the water. You, you'd hit the water again. So this is this incredibly humbling experience. It turned out that my key problem was a rookie mistake that a lot of people make when they, when they learn to water ski, and that is I was trying to pull myself out of the water on my own rather than letting the boat pull me out. Uh, I need to let the boat do the work rather than pull myself out. It was, it was about less trying and more trusting as I was getting pulled out of the water. Well, this happened to coincide with a time in my life when I was also coming back to the Lord and renewing my faith in Him as, uh, in late my high school years. And so I remember attaching a verse to it. And the verse was this. It was from James 4.10. It was, humble yourself before the Lord and He will lift you up. And I thought, that's the perfect verse for that time in my life. I needed to humble myself in the water and let God lift me up. It turns out the opposite is also true, as if you try to lift yourself up, God will humble you. That's true in water skiing, and that's true in life. Well, today we continue our series through the uh, book of Judges, the stories they skip in Sunday school. And as we have seen already, God is the hero of the book of Judges. It is this account of these broken, blemished leaders that God uses to faithfully deliver His people. Now, we don't spend a lot of time in the book of Judges. These are some of the most overlooked stories in the Bible. Or like Gideon, our focus today, we're in the middle of a, kind of a three-part series on Gideon. We do tell the story, but we leave out a lot of the the awkward, uncomfortable, or just a lot of details, the, the, these obscure details that don't make it into the story. But today and in this series, we want to address those head on. So here's the question that I want us to live with this morning as we're looking at this part of Gideon's story. Why would God use us? Why would He use us? Does He use us because we are courageous? Does he use us because we are ready and available? Does he use us because we are super trusting, full of faith? Well, open with me to Judges chapter 7. As we pick up the story, uh, God has drafted this obscure farmer to be the next deliverer of Israel, the next judge. But Gideon at first is hesitant. Last week, uh, in the first part of his life, we called him a reluctant hero. And if you missed it, you can catch that online. But now as we pick up the story, 
Gideon has is, is got to the place where he's convinced that God is with him. God is leading him. And so he gathers a bunch of troops to fight off their oppressors, to fight off the Midianites. So let's look at this account with that question in mind. Why did God use, use Gideon and his troops? And by way of application, why would he use us as well? Judges chapter 7, verse 1. It says this, early in the morning... Jerobal, that is Gideon, early in the morning Gideon and all his men camped at the spring of Herod. The camp of Midian was north of them in the valley near the hill of Morah. So the enemy is nearby, maybe a mile or two away, and they are a fierce enemy. Every harvest they would swoop down and destroy the crops of the Israelites. They were trying to starve them out. And the people cried out, to God for a deliverer, and Gideon, our reluctant hero, finally agrees, and now he has rallied the troops, and they're ready to go. The confrontation between these two armies now seems imminent, but then as the battle quickly approaches, as the two are about to come together, God says something completely absurd to Gideon. Verse 2, the Lord said to Gideon, you have too many men. What? What? What do you mean too many? I didn't think that was possible to have too many. Verse 2, the Lord said to Gideon, you have too many men. I cannot deliver Midian into their hands or Israel would boast against me. My own strength has saved me. So God has this plan to thin the crowds. Verse 3, now announce to the army, anyone who trembles with fear may turn back and leave Mount Gilead. So what do you think? Five, ten, twenty-five individuals turn and leave? So 22,000 men left, while 10,000 remain. I can't even imagine what is going on in the minds of the troops as they see thousands among them leave. Guys are looking around at each other. They're going, I wasn't afraid when there were 32,000 of us, but now I am worried. I'm out now. And by the time they are done, by the time they have decided the answer to the fear question, 22,000 men have left and are headed home. So here's, here's my logic. See if this makes sense. If the first group were dismissed because they trembled with fear. That implies that the others, the ones that remained, didn't. That they were fearless. That they were courageous. So the, that would mean that the reason that God would use us is because we are fearless. Is that the point here behind thinning the crowd at this point? God only wants those who are fearless to use them. Was that the point of reducing the army by 70%, eliminating the fearful ones? I haven't seen many of the Marvel movies, but I have a friend who really wants me to. He is curating a must-see list for me of the Marvel movies to, to watch along the way and the order in which I need to see them. I'm two in, so don't hold your breath, Noah. But, but anyway... We'll see how far I get. But there is something in us, isn't there, that wants the Bible characters to be sort of superheroes. We want them to, to rise above and be far above us uh, and these sort of incredibly amazing individuals. In fact, in the original comic books, one of Captain America's lines totally captures what we want to see in Gideon as well. Uh, Captain America says this, a single individual who has the right heart and the right mind that is consumed with a single purpose, that one man can win a war. He goes on to say, give, me, give that one man a group of soldiers with the same conviction and you can change the world. So is that what God is doing with Gideon? Giving him a group of fearless superheroes? Just a few good men? I mean, it kind of makes sense, except when you look at the book of Deuteronomy, which was their 
kind of marching orders as they went into the promised land that Moses gave the people there that they were supposed to use as their guide for life. When you look at that, we read these instructions about going into battle. It says this, When you are about to go into battle, the officer shall say to the army, Has anyone built a new house and not yet begun to live in it? Let him go home. Or he may die in battle and someone else may begin to live in it. That's quite generous, it seems to me. Let them go home. The Bible goes on to say this. He says, Has anyone planted a vineyard and not begun to enjoy it? Let him go home or else he may die in battle and someone else may enjoy it. Again, another allowance for bowing out of the battle. It continues. Has anyone become pledged to a woman and not married her? Let him go home, or he may die in battle and someone else may marry her. Again, quite generous. But here's the reason I'm telling you all of this. Because of the very next allowance. Here is what is pointed out here in this part of Moses' law. It says this, Then the officer shall add, Is anyone afraid or faint-hearted? Let him go home. So according to Deuteronomy, being afraid in battle is no less a sin than being engaged to be married, building a house, or planting a vineyard. It is one of the allowable reasons to bow out of battle. So I've got to believe that that God was still using the home builder, the farmer, the bride, the groom. So maybe this isn't really about identifying those who were fearless. Well, no matter what, no one expected 22,000 individuals to leave. I mean, the Midianites must have been an intimidating army to have that many people bow out. So Gideon is looking around at his dwindling army. Who was left? Like 30% of what he had. But God is not through. Look at verse 4. But the Lord said to Gideon, There are still too many men. What? What? Take them down to the water, and I will thin them out for you there. Have you ever noticed this? Sometimes when God is about to do a great work, He thins the crowd for His glory and for His purpose. Down to verse 5. So Gideon took the men down to the water. There the Lord told him, Separate those who lap the water with their tongues as a dog laps, from those who kneel down and drink. God says, here's what I want you to watch for. I want you to watch for the lappers. They they, they put their hand to their mouth and lap the water like a dog might. And then the kneelers, who get down on their knees and put their face in the water. Imagine uh, earlier when we were singing some of those, those great songs together, imagine that Ryan was leading us up here and I came up and said, hold on just a second. All of you who were just now when we were singing that were closing your eyes during the song, would you just kind of gather over there? And with all of you that had your eyes open during that song, would you just gather gather over here? One of you, one of the groups God really wants to use in in an incredible way. You'd be going, like, how random is that? And why that distinction? Verse 6, 300 of them drank from cupped hands, lapping like dogs. All the rest got down on their knees to drink. The Lord said to Gideon, with the 300 men that lapped, I will save you and give the Midianites into your hand. Let all the others go home. So this is some serious troop reduction. From 22,000 down to 10,000, that was down to 30%. That's drastic. But then he cuts the remaining group again, not just down to another 30% of that, but down to 3% of that. 3% of 10,000 is 300 men. So this is serious troop reduction. But here's what I want us to wrestle with. Why did God choose those 300? Many a Sunday school teacher and many a Sunday morning preacher are quick to tell us that they were the ones that kept their eyes open, ready and alert. In other words, God uses us because we are vigilant. We are alert and ready, available and watchful. But is that why? It's amazing how noble these lappers become in sermons everywhere. 
They are alert, scooping just a handful of water, eyes glued on the horizon, ever watchful for the enemy, even though the Bible never tells us what their eyes are doing. It's amazing how careless the kneelers become in Sunday school, foolishly letting down their guard, dunking their entire head in the water, selfishly thinking about only their own thirst, even though the Bible never tells us about their motives. The problem is, is that the Bible doesn't commend those who lap, nor does it fault those who kneel. Neither way of drinking is seen as the right way to drink. More than that, we don't have to theorize because God tells us exactly what his reasoning was back in verse 2. In verse 2, it says this, The Lord said to Gideon, You have too many men. I cannot deliver Midian into your hands, or Israel would boast against me. My own strength has saved me. Turns out God is not picking his A-team. These elite individuals, the cream of the crop. If he did, there would be reason to boast. Just the opposite. God is making his selection severe and arbitrary so that Israel could never say, I lifted myself up. I did this myself. Suddenly it has nothing to do with being fearless or vigilant. Suddenly it has nothing to do with them at all. Now I realize I'm messing with with Sunday school legendary here. I realize that uh, I'm messing with dozens of sermons you might have heard, but this is not about being fearless and vigilant. As one of my my seminary profs put it, it it was God alone. Uh, Let's look at that next, next, next slide. It was God alone, not the strength and power of Gideon, who delivered Israel from their enemies. Now, perhaps someone is still not fully with me. You still like the idea that Gideon's men were courageous and ready, that that's why God used them. So let's see how the story develops, especially in the parts that don't get told in Sunday school. Verse 8, so Gideon sent the rest of the Israelites home, but kept the 300 who took over the provisions and the trumpets of the others. Remember those trumpets. Think about those for a second. He, they, the, these 300 took over all the provisions and the trumpets. In a group of about 32,000 men, there might have been, you know, 300 trumpets. So there was a trumpet for each individual. End of verse 8, now, they, now the camp of Midian lay below him in the valley. And during the night, the Lord said to Gideon, Get up and go down against the camp, because I am going to give it into your hands. It's go time, Gideon. It's the middle of the night. There's a clear promise from God. Let's do this. But then notice this concession in verse 11. God says, If you are afraid to attack, go down to the camp with your servant Purah and listen to what they are saying. Afterwards, you will be encouraged to attack the camp. Now, Gideon obviously said, No way, I'm fine. I'm good. I mean, from chapter 6, we know that God has already given him an angel, a promise, a sign, another sign, and another sign. There's no way Gideon is fearful and needs another sign. Middle of verse 11. So he and Purah, his servant, went down to the outpost of the camp. He goes. He takes God up on it. He is afraid. Gideon's like, actually, God, no offense, but the whole 32,000 down to 300 kind of got me a little nervous. And I could use a little encouragement. The Lord knows our fears. And if the Gideon story teaches us anything, it is that God is so ready to accommodate them. No, no, God doesn't use us because we are fearless. Even their leader was fearful. Gideon gets there uh, to the enemy camp, and here's what happens in verse 12. It says, Then the Midianites and the Amalekites and all the other eastern peoples had settled in the valley thick as locusts. Their camels could no more be counted than the sand of the seashore. This only heightens Gideon's fear. 
when he sees how many there are compared to how few he has. And then Gideon overhears this in verse 13. Gideon arrived just as a man was telling his friend a dream. I had a dream, he was saying. A round loaf of barley bread came tumbling into the Midian camp. It struck the tent with such force that the tent overturned and collapsed. Back then, barley was considered this inferior grain, only half the value of wheat. The idea here is that God was going to say some, take something very common, very ordinary, even inferior and devalued, and deliver Israel. Hmm. Turns out this dream captures the very theme of the book of Judges in a great image. God uses these common, ordinary, flawed, and blemished people to accomplish his mission. And even an unbeliever gets it. I mean, look at the interpretation of this dream by a Midian soldier. Verse 14, his friend responded, This can be nothing more than the sword of Gideon, son of Joash, the Israelite. God has given the Midianites and the whole camp into his hands. When Gideon heard the dream and its interpretation, especially the interpretation, he bowed down and he worshipped. It was becoming clear, incredibly clear to Gideon, that God doesn't use us because we are fearless. God doesn't use us because we are vigilant. He uses us as we bow down and worship. He uses us when we are dependent on Him. And that's what the story was all about. That God was getting them to the place where they realized that their boast was in the Lord. Their confidence was in Him. Their strength was in Him. So Gideon bows down and he worships. And now he is ready. Finally ready. Middle of verse 15. He returned to the camp of Israel and called out, Get up. The Lord has given the Midianite camp into your hands. Dividing the 300 men into three companies, he placed trumpets. Remember the trumpets? These would actually have been ram's horns. He placed trumpets and empty jars in the hands of all of them with torches inside. Gideon tells them to go into the camp, to stand at the edge of the camp, and to blow the trumpets. I played trumpet when I was, uh, for one year when I was in third grade. I never thought of it as a military weapon. Who knows, I might have played it longer if I did. But yep, this was their big military strategy. Not their elite training, not their vigilance, not their power, their hot air. That was it. Skip down to verse 22. When the 300 trumpets sounded, the Lord, ca- the Lord caused the men throughout the camp to turn on each other with their sword. It was a ridiculous weapon. In the same category as Shamgar's ox code and Samson's donkey jaw. God is using these random items in unexpected ways to demonstrate that he is the ultimate deliverer. And he uses them so that we would learn to be dependent upon him. It's a great story from the life of Gideon, but I want to leave our time today with a couple key takeaways. Two key takeaways. First of all, if we're not careful, it would be tempting to think that the moral of the story is for us to simply be weak. But here's the first takeaway. Don't try to be weak Try to be dependent. The danger for Gideon and his army was not being too big, too powerful, or too skillful. That was not the danger. The danger was being self-deceived into thinking that their size, their power, or their skill was their success. So God thinned the crowd in the most ridiculous way to make it clear that it was him, not them. See, the human tendency is to take credit for what God does. God's goal is not to make us weak. His goal is to make us dependent. And he'll use whatever means he he can. He chooses to get us there. 
He, he wants us to realize that even on our best days, we are weak, and so we need to rely on Him. Second takeaway is this. Once you know you are weak, God then turns it into a strength. When we realize that even on our best days we are weak, God turns it into a strength. Have you ever noticed what it says about Gideon in the book of Hebrews? It's a great passage. In the famous Hall of Faith, in Hebrews chapter 11, it lists all these great Old Testament individuals and how God used them because of their faith in the Old Testament. And and there the author says this. He says this, I do not have time to tell about Gideon. There's our reluctant hero, Gideon. Then he lists a bunch of others, Barak, Samson, and Jephthah, about David and Samuel and the prophets. And then after listing them, he lists a bunch of their accomplishments, who through faith conquered kingdoms, administered justice, and gained what was promised, who shut the mouths of lions, who quenched the fury of flames, and escaped the edge of the sword. All pretty amazing and crazy things that God had these individuals do. But then it mentions one more phrase that seems especially pertinent to Gideon, whose weakness was turned to strength. That is the story of Gideon, whose weakness was turned to strength. And that's the story of us. That's the story that God wants to tell in our lives. We don't have to make ourselves weak. We are weak. This is not about choosing to be bad at certain things or or intentionally handicapping ourselves so that we are weaker than we are. This is a recognition that even on our best days with our best selves and our greatest attributes, we we are weak before God. And then to let God turn that revelation, that reality, into our greatest strength. If you're a follower of Jesus today, here's what I know is true about you. Someday, God is going to make you perfect. In the meantime, He wants to make you dependent. He wants to make you dependent on Him, to trust Him. You know, when we first met Gideon, he he was reluctant. But God turns a reluctant hero into a reliant one who's trusting him and dependent on him. And that's what God wants to do for all of us as well. Lord God, I thank you so much for uh, the process that you work in our lives, the way you move us. In, in these ways, and, and you orchestrate the details of our lives for us to see ourselves as we truly are, wonderful and fearfully made before you, but, but weak when it comes to all that you want to do in us and through us. And so, Lord, we pray that we would see ourselves as we truly are, but also see you as you truly are, and that, that, that vision, that understanding, that reality of who you are would transform us Lord, we thank you for Gideon. We thank you for the ways that we relate to him, the ways that we are like him in our lives as well. And we pray that you would grow in us a faith as we see you as the the God who can do so much in our lives around us. Thank you, Lord, today for blessing our church. Thank you for blessing our life together, for giving us the ability to reach out into this community with the truth of the gospel. We pray that you would use the resources that come in today, uh, both online and, and here in, the, in this out, the sanctuary, for your glory, that others might know the reality that, that though we are blemished and frail people, we serve a great and powerful God who is ready to use us. In Christ's name we pray, amen.